Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel. The whole goal when it comes to investing is to maximize our returns, to grow our money as much as possible. I mean, who doesn't want that? And the wonderful thing is there's small things you can do that make a huge difference. I'm talking adding up to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in increased returns over the course of an entire investing career. And the good news is some of these don't actually even involve investing more money. These are just slight course corrections that you can make that drastically change that end balance that you end up with. And being that they're just small maneuvers, some that don't even involve putting more money into the market and still leave you with a higher ending balance, the question becomes, why wouldn't you do them? Funding your investment accounts earlier in the year can actually have a dramatic impact on your portfolio over time, especially if you do this throughout the course of your entire investing career. This specific bullet point and consequently this entire video was actually inspired by an email I received from Vanguard. They sent me a big old congratulations for maxing out my Roth IRA in 2023 and a gentle reminder to get contributing early and funding the account for 2024. They even included this little graphic suggesting suggesting that over a 20 year investing time horizon, if you fund your account at the beginning of the year versus at the end, putting the exact same amount in this account with this subtle shift could leave you with almost $20,000 more in your account. The longer your investing time horizon, the bigger this difference would be. So I thought it'd be fun to run an example over say a 45 year investing time horizon, say starting at the age of 20 and investing all the way to the age of 65. Currently, for those under the age of 50, the max annual contribution to a Roth IRA is $7,000. If you assume an 8% annual rate of return, contributing the $7,000 at the beginning of the year as opposed to at the end of the year over the course of 45 years, that could translate into almost a quarter of a million dollar difference in portfolios when you step away from the workforce. Timing of this funding matters. If you can fund your account earlier in the year, say January, as opposed to say December, you maximize your compounding time. You essentially get an additional year of compounding. And if you use dollar cost averaging, you're probably gonna end up somewhere between these two extremes. I like to think of it as the good, better, best approach. Good is gonna be funding your account by the end of the year. Better is gonna be dollar cost averaging throughout the course of the year, and best is funding it right at the start of the year. I feel like reducing investment costs can come up on a couple different fronts. First and foremost, I'm a huge fan of investing in index funds. Index funds and ETFs are a wonderful low cost option when it comes to investing. They have low expense ratios, low turnover, and all of that translates to you keeping more of your money invested and working for you. If you use an index fund like the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund with an expense ratio of 0.04%, that means for every $10,000 you have invested, this expense is just $4. Alternatively, if you use actively managed funds, inevitably you're going to pay higher fees and a higher expense ratio. Although it is worth noting that low cost brokerage houses like Vanguard and Fidelity do offer reasonably priced actively managed funds if that is something you're interested, but just know that the fees are going to be a little bit higher than say index funds and ETFs. But over time with the popularity of index funds, the fees associated with actively managed funds and their expense ratios has been pushed down but there are still funds out there that are much pricier and likely don't warrant their expense when cheaper index alternatives are available and these more expensive funds haven't proven a superior performance. In the same vein of wanting to keep costs low, you should consider the costs if you want to work with a financial professional. Now I know so much of this audience is made up of DIY personal finance people because quite frankly, that's the same camp I'm in. But ultimately, there are a lot of people out there that once they reach a certain level of wealth, really want to work with a financial pro. They wanna have that sounding board that they can bounce ideas off and make sure that they're protecting what they've worked so hard to build. When it comes to working with a financial professional, there's a lot of different ones out there with very different pricing structures. You can meet with an advisor who charges a flat hourly rate. That way you're only paying for the time that you're actually with them. Admittedly, these 
these advisors are harder to find, but they are out there. Or you can work with a fee-only financial advisor. Now, these ones are typically gonna charge a percentage of assets under management. Usually that fee is around 1%, but it can be higher. So just know what you're getting into if you work with an advisor like this. Or if you're looking for a lower cost route, a lot of the brokerage houses like Vanguard, these low cost brokerage houses actually do offer these financial planning services and will tailor a plan to you. And they do it at a very reasonable fee when it comes to active management. Vanguard actually uses a fee structure of 0.3% of assets under management. For instance, if you have a $2 million portfolio and use the Vanguard Personal Advisor Services, your annual fees would come to $6,000. Alternatively, you could use an advisor who charges 1% of assets under management and your annual expenses would be about $20,000. Do you really think the advice coming from a financial pro who's charging 1% of assets under management is actually more valuable than the advice you might get from these personal finance services at a low cost brokerage house? Now, no judgment. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just what is right for you. So much of the value of having a financial advisor when you reach a substantial nest egg comes from the fact that they can keep you on track. They can keep you from making really expensive mistakes, but that doesn't mean you should pay higher fees than necessary. When it comes to your investments, you have two options on how you treat dividends. You can opt to automatically reinvest dividends that are paid by your investments, or you can opt to have those dividends paid out to you. And I think sometimes people underestimate the power of dividend reinvestment as a percentage of returns over time. It's said that about 40% of the stock market returns since the 1930s has come from dividends alone, and an even higher percentage during periods of high inflation or stagnant market growth. If you invested $1,000 into the S&P in the year 1980 and just let it sit until 2022 without dividend reinvestment, it would have grown to a little bit over $33,000. However, with dividend reinvestment, it would have grown to nearly $93,000. Dividend reinvestment makes a huge difference. If you work for a company that offers a 401k account or a similar type employer-sponsored retirement account with a matching contribution, that can be an incredibly valuable asset when it comes to building up your investments. But a shockingly high number of people don't participate in these plans when they're available, and even up to a third of participants don't contribute enough to capture the full employer match. Now, traditionally, the employer match on a 401k account ranges from 4 to 6%. We've all heard the statement that you don't want to leave free money on the table. And if you're not contributing at least up to the employer match, that's exactly what you're doing. And over time, this can end up being a substantial amount of money in terms of what the employer contribution actually is and what it could grow to through compounding over time. Just to keep the calculation simple, let's say you have a job that pays $100,000 a year and you work for an employer who has a 5% match dollar for dollar on their 401k. If you put away 5%, that's $5,000. Your employer will match that 5% for $5,000. That means every year $10,000 is getting invested. That means you have a 10% savings rate. That's not too shabby. And let's say that this is the only investment you make exactly up to the employer match. Assuming an 8% rate of return over a 40-year career, your contributions plus your employer contributions could potentially grow to nearly $3 million. Without that employer match, the portfolio would be cut in half, a little bit under $1.5 million. This requires no extra effort on your part to essentially double your portfolio over time. All it requires is that you work for an employer who offers a match and taking advantage of it. That is incredibly valuable. It's also important to keep in mind vesting periods when it comes to these retirement accounts. This is a period of time that you have to wait in order to gain incremental or full access to those employer contributions. There are different types of vesting schedules, one known as a cliff vesting schedule where you gain 100% access to the employer contributions after a set period of time, or a graded vesting schedule where you incrementally gain ownership over those employer contributions, or a hybrid approach of the two. And the thing to keep in mind is that if you leave a job prior to being fully vested, you could lose all or a portion of those employer matching contributions. This could end up being a significant amount of money. Too frequent job changes can result in you leaving a significant percentage of these employer contributions behind. And it's not to say that you should never leave a job before you're fully vested, because what if you were leaving for, say, a higher paying job? But if that is your situation, make sure to do a cost-benefit analysis. 
Most of us, when we start out working, we start working in a starter job, which often comes with starter pay, which often isn't that high. But still, one of the very best things you can do when you get started earning your very first paycheck is to start investing right away, even small amounts. Maybe that's $25 a week, maybe it's $50 a month. In the beginning, it doesn't really matter so much what you're actually putting away, but that you're building up that habit of regularly contributing to investments. However, what you don't want to be doing is still be investing those initial sum amounts when you're say 5, 10, 15 years into your career when your salary has maybe doubled at that point. As your income increases, you want to increase the amount that you're saving and investing. That's why it's so great to use a percentage-based model, say saving 10% or 15% of your income, because as your income increases, you naturally increase the total dollar amount that you're contributing to savings and investments. And in the same vein, we often talk about auto escalation, which is slowly but surely increasing the percentage that you're investing over time. When you start investing, maybe you don't have a lot of wiggle room in your budget. So maybe you start with say, saving 5% of your pay. And then a handful of months down the road, maybe you increase that by 1%. And now you invest say 6% of your pay. And you continue this pattern increasing over time. Maybe it's on an annual basis. Anytime you get a raise, anytime you find you have a little bit of room to push yourself, you increase that percentage by just 1% until you get to your desired goal savings rate. The good news is that a lot of 401k plans actually offer this auto escalation feature these days. However, if you're using an individual account like an IRA or simply funding through a brokerage account, you would likely have to do this on your own. Staying invested longer sounds like such a simple one, but I think sometimes people forget the power of just investing a tiny bit longer. Think about it like this. When we're talking about trying to reach financial freedom quicker and we talk about addressing expenses, we say that it helps on two fronts. If you can reduce your expenses, it frees up the amount of cash you have to work with so you can save and invest more. However, if you find ways to reduce your expenses, you actually lower your financial freedom number that you would actually need to hit. It helps on two fronts. Well, staying invested longer hits the same way. If you can keep investing and working for say an additional year or maybe two, to a relatively short amount of time. That gives your money a longer runway to compound and those years can be quite significant once your portfolio has built up some momentum and it also reduces the number of years you're actually drawing on this portfolio. For instance, the difference between investing for 38 years and 40 years at a rate of $5,000 a year and an 8% rate of return is a little over $200,000. That $200,000, if you use a safe rate of withdrawal of 4%, could provide you an additional $8,000 of annual income. Also, in those two years, if you were at age for, say, Social Security, but you delayed claiming, your benefit would increase over time. This can have a significant impact on the income you have to work with in your golden years. Tax loss harvesting involves selling poor performing securities at a loss to offset a capital gains tax liability. This tactic can save you money at tax time. And alternatively, you can take that money that you save and invest it in your investments. And who doesn't want a lower tax bill? And while this doesn't inherently boost the performance of your investments, it does give you more money to invest. I do have an entire video on tax loss harvesting that I will link down below if you're interested. Last but not least, and arguably the most important thing you can do is continually invest in yourself. This will include trying out new classes, getting new certifications, pursuing a business if there's something that you're passionate about, or setting stretch goals for yourself within your career. Anything you can do to increase your knowledge base or your skill set is going to make you a more desirable professional, and that can help to increase your income over time. We can see based on data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, income increases pretty steadily until you get into the 35 to 44 age bracket. Beyond that, income tends to stagnate, and that's because people get comfortable in their career, and often that involves settling to some degree or another. Those years between 35 and 64 are still incredibly powerful. It would be a shame to let your income earning potential stagnate for those decades. Implementing these adjustments doesn't just add up, it compounds over time. Making use of some of these strategies can literally over time lead to a portfolio that is several hundreds of thousands of dollars higher than what it otherwise would have been. 
Making smart choices now, even if they seem small, can have a huge impact on your future. What are some that you might try to implement or ones that you already implemented before watching this video? Share your thoughts in a comment down below. I post new videos every single week. If you got anything at all out of this one, please give it a like. If you're new here, please consider subscribing or if you know of someone who might get something out of this type of content, please consider sharing. I'll see you soon. Bye.